I'd like to welcome you to the introduction to clinical management of anthrax. My name is Dr. Michelle Barron. I am a professor of medicine at the School of Medicine at the University of Colorado at Denver. And I am also uh, the Senior Medical Director for Infection Prevention for UC Health. Again, thank you very much for being here. For disclosures, the Mountain Plains Regional Disaster Health Response System Just-in-Time Learning Series is funded by award number 6HITEP20004301013 uh, from ASPR. The content of this presentation is a product of the individual presenters and does not re represent the official policy of the United States government. This information is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Um, and I have no relevant financial interest or relationships to disclose. The module agenda includes uh, discussing the microbiology and epidemiology of Bacillus anthracis, anthrax, identify the common clinical presentations, uh, how to diagnose it, as well as key management strategies. We're going to start with a little historical context. On October 4th of 2001, the Florida Department of Health and Centers for Disease Control uh, confirmed the first case of inhal inhalational anthrax in the US in 25 years. Within two days, uh, a team of multiple investigators identified that it was actually anthrax spores contamination at a patient's workplace, and they were associated with letters that had been sent to this particular individual. Um, this was the first U.S. outbreak of bioterrorism-related anthrax, and it was uh, the first time in uh, since the onset of preparedness for this type of event to actually see what uh, preparedness looked like in the real world. There were 22 people, including 12 male handlers, who actually got infected with anthrax. Five of these individuals ended up dying. And it's so in this context of the potential for bioterrorism that we will start with the basics. So make microbiology and epidemiology. Um, anthrax is a bacillus species. Um, it's a gram-positive rod-shaped bacteria. It's something that we see naturally in soil and affects uh, primarily animals. Um, and actually we don't see a lot of it in the United States, primarily because many of the animals in the United States are vaccinated against this. And also probably um, just the soil and the temperature differentiation compared to other parts of the world. Um, wild animals and domestic animals can become infected with anthrax. Uh, we think about this more commonly in cattle, sheep, and goats, but certainly deer and others can also be um, can, can eat contaminated grass or things contaminated with the spores um, and then become sick with this. Um, it can cause illness in both humans and animals as well. The clinical presentations of anthrax, um, there's three of them that are important to recognize and they're all slightly different. Cutaneous anthrax is the most common and it typically occurs when there's inoculation of spores either through a cut or if you're handling uh, an infected animal or contaminated animal products like wool, hides or hair. Um, once the spore has inoculated into the skin, it typically will start to sporulate and form more spores um, and also produces toxin, which is why you often see some necrosis at the areas of where the injection site is. This can mimic spider bites or other types of infections, so it's important to recognize it as a risk and take adequate history to be able to identify this. It usually will develop one to seven days after the exposure, although the range can be up to 19 days. While um, clinically often limited, it can develop into something more serious. And you can see the pictures on the right with different, uh, the first is of a forearm with the inoculation site obvious with the necrotic center. The second picture displays somebody with a lesion on their face. And the third is actually bolus lesions that developed um, due to progression of the anthrax. Um, so it's important, A, to have clinical suspicion, and then obviously treatment is important as the, up to 20% of those um, without adequate treatment can die from this. The initial presentation after inoculation 
um, is small blisters or bumps. Sometimes they can itch, so that can certainly uh, cause some diagnostic dilemmas because people that have had contact with animals or otherwise could also have an allergic reaction. Um, the swelling tends to increase though, and then a painless skin sore with the black center um, with a necrotic area can actually appear. And again, they tend to occur most often on the face, neck, arms, and hands, only because they are the areas where you're most likely to have contact uh, with animals or the soil and, and wa contaminated water. Um, the next type of anthrax uh, presentation is inhalational. This is extraordinarily rare. Um, we do not typically see this in the United States. Um, and when you do see one, certainly there would be concern that there would be risk of um, domestic terrorism. Um, the inhalation starts uh, by inhaling the spores. Uh, they go into the lymph nodes in the chest. And from there, they're able to disseminate throughout the body. Um, this is not something that is spread person to person, even though it appears to have pneumonitis. Um, the infection typically occurs about a week after exposure, can be delayed up to two months. Um, this can be very aggressive and uh, can cause uh, respiratory failure as well as sepsis. And so it's very important to have this uh, diagnosis on your differential to be able to potentially detect it and then obviously to treat it appropriately. And even with aggressive treatments, um, about 45% of individuals still die. One of the characteristics um, for someone with inhalational anthrax is a very widened mediastinum. And that is sometimes a clue that perhaps this is on the diagnosis. However, there are certainly many other diagnoses, non-infectious, that can certainly still cause a widened mediastinum. They don't typically well present with sepsis. The symptoms for inhalational anthrax uh, can be quite variable and actually very nonspecific. They can be include fever and chills, shortness of breath, cough, headaches, myalgias, all flu-like symptoms. Um, sweats are quite prominent, often drenching, um, but you can also have GI symptoms such as abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting. So again, you have to have a very high clinical acumen to be thinking about this and also important to get a good history. Certainly in the setting of a potential bioterrorism event, um, individuals may or may not realize that they've been exposed to this as anthrax is colorless and does not have um, any type of odor. Um, some of the diagnostic clues to this is when you have multiple people coming in with similar symptoms um, in a time frame that's not typically typical for flu, and perhaps have all been at the same locations. The last um, clinical presentation is that of a gastrointestinal anthrax. Again, this uh, rarely has been reported in the United States. Um, this typically occurs when someone eats raw or undercooked meat from an animal infected with anthrax. And so again, this is typically domestic animals like goats or cattle. However, also deer and antelope can also occur. Um, when you ingest this, the spores uh, can actually cause infection in the upper GI tract, including your throat and esophagus, and then can certainly end up in your stomach and intestines and cause hemorrhaging. Infection usually occurs from one to seven days after exposure. More than half of people with GI anthrax die, and likely because it's not on the differential when people come in. These individuals can look quite sick and, um, again, have very similar symptoms to uh, flu and nonspecific. Fever, chills, sore throat, swelling of your uh, lymph nodes, problem swallowing, nausea and vomiting. Um, blood is typically associated with uh, nausea and vomiting as well as diarrhea. Um, you can have stomach pain. Um, ascites is often very prominent as well. So a high index of suspicion is necessary to be able to obviously consider this as a diagnosis and then obviously to treat it appropriately. For the diagnosis of um, inhalational anthrax, a chest x-ray or chest CT is important and as part of the initial workup. It would be typical because patients will be presenting with cough and shortness of breath. And um, the pictures on the right um, show the 
areas where there's increased lymphadenopathy and a widened mediastinum. For confirmation, the diagnosis is typically done via direct uh, direct isolation of, of anthrax from blood, from skin lesions or swabs, or from respiratory secretions and spinal fluid. It's less likely that you will recover it from these other sites, but it is certainly worth testing because it can sometimes cause uh, meningoencephalitis as well as pneumonia. Antibodies or toxins in the blood is another way serologically to detect exposure, um, but may not be as clinically relevant um, as they sometimes uh, take periods of time to return and so may not be able to help you immediately. For treatment, um, there are different treatment durations and different types of treatment depending on what the type of infection you have. For mild, uncomplicated cutaneous anthrax, penicillin G or amoxicillin for five to seven days is considered first-line therapy. In the setting of allergy, doxycycline or ciprofloxacin are the alternative agents, and again, for five to seven days. For complicated cutaneous or systemic anthrax, again, penicillin or amoxicillin are first line. Doxycycline or ciprofloxacin would have been considered appropriate, and the duration is 10 to 14 days. If you have internal organ anthrax, such as GI uh, anthrax, or it's a severe case, um, the recommendation is for you to, to use intravenous penicillin, ampicillin, in or some of the more broader antibiotics like uh, carbapenems in combination with cipro, vancomycin, rifampin, or clindamycin and linazolid. There's also a specific antitoxin serum that can be administered, but it's not typically readily available, and it would be something you would need to obtain in consultation with the Centers for Disease Control. Something of note is that if the uh, infection is thought to be due to a biological weapon or bioterrorism related event, the recommendation is to actually use ciprofloxacin or doxycycline in lieu of penicillin or amoxicillin. It is uh, thought that some of the generated anthrax spores uh, used in these types of events could have uh, resistance uh, to penicillins intrinsic to them. It's also noteworthy that the treatment duration for someone that's had a bioterrorism related event is 42 to 60 days, as opposed to the shorter durations that you see with clinical disease associated with animals or contaminated food and water. For post-exposure prophylaxis, the full regimen is 60 days, and the antibiotic choices are similar to those which we use for uh, treatment. Um, in these cases, ciprofloxacin and dexacycline, again, at standard dosing uh, for other types of infections is recommended. Levofloxacin has not been as studied, but it's considered equivalent to ciprofloxacin and may be administered for ease of choice. Amoxicillin is considered uh, less uh, useful because of the dosing intervals. There's also an anthrax vaccine, um, the all named in the United States as anthrax vaccine absorbed, ADA, uh, which is a six dose series, which has also been shown to be effective for treatment of inhalational anthrax if given with antibiotics. There is not extensive studies um, evaluating the use of this combination and availability, it is limited. In terms of treatment decisions for post-exposure prophylaxis, um, there are general recommendations not to use fluoroquinolones for children under the age of 14 and also to avoid doxycycline. This is also true for pregnant persons. However, this needs to be a discussion and a consideration in terms of the exposure and the risk to the individual of developing fulminant disease versus the potential risk for side effects or potential toxicities during pregnancy. Infection prevention is standard barrier isolation precautions. Um, this is not an infection that is transmitted from person to person, um, even in the inhalational stages where individuals with pneumonia would appear to be spewing um, 
spores into the air, that does not occur. You do not need N95 mask or poppers. You do wanna make sure that you use gowns and gloves if you're touching uh, cutaneous lesions like you would for any other type of lesions as well. There's not a need to immunize or provide PEP to patient contacts unless they were a part of the original exposure to the spores. If you suspect that somebody has anthrax, please notify your lab immediately as the specimens can be um, manipulated in the appropriate uh, lab space in the BL3 lab. Also notify infection control and your hospital epidemiologist as well as the state health department as these are reportable events and there could be clusters of other cases that have yet to be identified. Cleaning of the room is standard um, and the agents that are typically used to clean rooms are effective for cleaning and so there's not special precautions necessary. If an individual was to die, it is recommended uh, that cremation be done in lieu of embalming only because there's potential risk of um, in the embalming process to um, disperse some of the spores if still present. For decontamination, um, there's two concerns. Obviously, there's the risk of the individual as well as surfaces that also could be impacted from this. It's really not known that once it lands on the surface, um, how much um, the surface contamination can then potentially resuspend into the air. There are rapid assay kits that are available that can detect uh, um, bacillus anthracis on surfaces, um, but they can have false positives. And so certainly would need alternative tests to determine if they, um, the, the spores were viable or actually there. If an individual has had direct physical contact with a substance that's either alleged or confirmed to contain um, anthrax spores, you wanna ensure that they thoroughly wash uh, the exposed skin and any articles of clothing with soap and water. And all these individuals should be started on post-exposure prophylaxis um, until it's either confirmed as truly is anthrax or um, obviously can stop it if it's confirmed that it is not anthrax. If the event in which uh, this dispersion was via a powder, it's really important to remember that the spores can actually travel long distances. In the original reports out of the um, letters and envelopes that were filled with anthrax that were mailed in Florida, some of the individuals did not have direct contact with the envelopes, but were in offices uh, adjacent to the individual who received the envelopes. Um, and so, you must again have low threshold to include these individuals in decontamination as well as for treatment with exposure prophylaxis. This is our bibliography with some references. Um, the uh, CDC has some excellent resources for individuals as well as for patients who have questions. Um, and the most recent uh, guide statement consensus guidelines is the last reference. Thank you, and um, we appreciate your time and effort.